All right, so third group we're going to focus on on the civil rights movements will be the American Indian Movement, typically known as AIM, and their push for civil rights. So, major problems in this community that will lead to the formation of the American Indian Movement will be broken treaties, the allotment um, policy conducted by the United States of America uh, through the Dawes Act that stripped a lot more land away from um, American Indians, boarding schools, termination and relocation policies by the United States government as well. So, first question, problems between native tribes and the United States government included which? A, treaties, B, allotment, C, boarding schools, D, termination, E, relocation, or F, all of the above. So, broken treaties, right? The US, United States government broke somewhere around 370 treaties that they signed with Native Americans or American Indians throughout our history. Uh, one prominent example I'll show right here, the Black Hills of South Dakota. In the Black Hills, uh, a lot of it was designated as Indian land, right, uh, as part of their um, allotment of land, part of their um, reservation. That was all well and good until we found gold in the Black Hills. Then we forced the Indians, the, the Sioux Indians, out of uh, their land so that we could mine it for gold. That's just one example, right? There'll be Hundreds of other examples like that. Next one. So uh, we talked about allotment, right? So by the 1880s, all the reservations were basically in place, or at least the idea of reservations was in place. So if you look at this map here on the left, the dark gray area is what area was controlled by Native Americans uh, in the years uh, leading up to, let's see here, it says 19, I'll get really close. So 1915, or sorry, 1715, the last one is in the early 1900s, so or the late 1900s. So this how much land was controlled by native groups. You fast forward into the late 1900s. That's how much land is left. Right. So they will lose the vast majority of their land throughout all of this. Part of how it goes away is through the Dawes Act, the Dawes Severalty Act, okay, which creates allotment. So uh, the, uh, the easiest way to explain is imagine we're all here in the classroom, right? Like we prefer to be. Uh, all of us are together in the classroom. This classroom, and we'll consider us to be a Native American tribe. This classroom, all the land in it, all the floor space, all of the desks and everything, that's our reservation. And uh, with the Dawes Act, the government came in and said, hey, guess what? Instead of this land being all of yours together, this classroom being all of yours together, you get your own personal property, just that desk. You get that for you and your family. That's your plot of land. You look around, there's a bunch of floor space that doesn't have desks on it. What do we do with that extra, with that extra land? Well, that extra land gets opened up to be sold to white people, right? So they will lose two-thirds more of their land through the Dawes Act. This does not get reversed until the Indian New Deal in the, in the 1930s. So boarding schools we talked about. Between 1890 and the 1950s, Indian boarding schools taught assimilation. Assimilation is basically giving up your culture to fit into uh, the culture that you moved into, right? So say I moved to France, if I stopped speaking English and just ate baguettes or whatever, that would be me assimilating into French culture. This was forced assimilation, right? So here's the same group of Apache Indians. They would take these kids away from their parents, they'd move them across the country to a boarding school, they'd cut their hair, they'd change their names, they'd force them to speak English, they couldn't speak Apache anymore, you couldn't dance or do any of your cultural routines, you had to act like a white American. That's what these boarding schools did. By the 1960s, the conditions on reservations were awful, and they still are mostly awful. High poverty, high unemployment, high suicide, high drug abuse, high alcohol abuse, high dropout rates. Okay. So, with all that said, in 1961, uh, American Indian groups will start forming in a more modern sense to address these issues. So the National Congress of American Indians is formed in 61. They want to control federal programs and treaty rights. And they want to take control from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So, in 1968, the American Indian Movement, AIM, was founded in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They were dedicated to protecting the lives and culture of Native Americans, and their first goal was to deal with police brutality on the reservations. At this point uh, in history here in the 60s, reservations were patrolled by non-reservation um, people, right? So they would drive in from the city or from wherever to patrol the reservation. And there were oftentimes issues with police brutality. 
So Ames founded to try to put an end to that. Nowadays, each tribe has their own police department. They have their own court system based on the American court system and all that sort of stuff. But back then, it was different. So, next question. AIM was founded to protect the lives and culture of Native Americans, but its first goal was dealing with what? A, police brutality. B, environmental issues. C, alcohol and drug abuse. Or D, federal recognition. All right, so American Indian Movement is going to try to draw attention to American Indian issues. Uh, one big one we see here, the March on Columbus Day. There's a movement to change it from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day to celebrate the people who were actually here and build communities and stuff like that, uh, and not just Columbus who accidentally found it. So uh, one person to talk about that I learned about, about uh, this summer, so I added this to it. Johnny Cash was super supportive of the American Indian movement. In fact, he released a CD called Bitter Tears, Ballads of the American Indian, a concept album that served to draw attention to the plight of Native Americans. He believed that he had some Cherokee ancestry, and he was inspired by Native American activism and issues in the 1960s, which was a time of social upheaval in the United States. He was concerned about the injustices against the Native American community. The songs on this album addressed the harsh and unfair treatment of the indigenous peoples of North America by Europeans in the United States. To deal, uh, it was also to deal with 20th century issues affecting the Seneca and Pima peoples. It was considered controversial, was rejected by some radio stations and fans, but Johnny Cash himself right here, Bitter Tears, very supportive of the American Indian movement. All right, so what does AIM start to do? Well, the first big things that AIM does is they occupy Alcatraz Island. So if you've seen any old uh, gangster movies, Alcatraz was like our most high-level, high-security prison in the country. It was off the coast of San Francisco. It's an island prison. Right, which was hard to escape from the way the currents work would push boats back into it and all this sort of stuff. Uh, they occupied this uh, island because it, by 1969 we weren't using Alcatraz as a prison anymore as a tourist location nowadays. Right, so in 1868 there was a treaty signed in Wyoming, the Treaty of Fort Laramie. Uh, the treaty promised that the Sioux surplus of federal uh, promised the Sioux Indians surplus federal land. Right, that they would get land. That was extra federal land given to them as part of this treaty, as part of them giving up some of their land. But it was clear, right, the Sioux were not, had no ancestral claims to land as far as west as the San Francisco, but they said, you know what, you've broken treaties, we're going to go ahead and take this one and bend it a little bit. So in 1969, five, uh, more than 5,000, 5,600 American Indians will travel to Alcatraz Island and they will occupy the island for 19 months, so just over a year and a half. Uh, they wanted to set a positive example, meaning no violence, but that won't last. So, in 1969, Native groups organized and occupied on Alcatraz Island. How long were they there? Was it A, for one year, B, for 14 months, C, for a year and a half, or D, for 19 months? All right, so, continuing on. A lot of celebrities supported it, okay? Uh, CCR, Creedence Clearwater Revival, was a fan. They sent food and money. So did the Grateful Dead, another prominent band. Jane Fonda, an actress. Marlon Brando, an actor. And other polit some, some politicians joined in as well. Uh, lots of problems, though, uh, of this occupation, right? A lot of different tribes. A lot of people that didn't necessarily like each other, right? There have been issues between one tribe and another. There would be some issues where it becomes almost uh, anarchy on the island. Drugs and alcohol were brought in and abused by some members of uh, this occupation group. And it all reaches ahead uh, when a 12-year-old girl, Yvonne Oaks, um, falls three stories to her death while she was climbing around on something, some part of the Alcatraz complex. What would they do with the people there? Right? Some government officials wanted to take it over using uh, the National Guard or the military. President Nixon says no. Eventually, a fire starts, burning four of the buildings down, and this will be the end of the occupation. People will begin to leave on their own. At the very end, uh, the FBI gets there and arrests like three people who are still around. Okay? This will inspire, though, the spread of the Red Power Movement. Right? We had a Black Power Movement, we have a Red Power Movement as well. Uh, when the government first asks them to leave, they will offer the federal government $24 worth of beads and cloth for the island. Um, perhaps you've heard this story, maybe you haven't, they don't really tell it as much, but there was uh, this idea that uh, European settlers would basically buy huge pieces of land from Native Americans by just giving them things like beads or shiny objects. 
Um, the most notorious example will be the, the island of Manhattan off of New York will be supposedly bought for $24 worth of beads and cloth. Now, the Indians who accepted those beads and cloths accepted them as a, as a token of friendship and they were going to share the land, but of course, uh, the um, European explorers didn't see it that way, right? And then when the Indians tried to come back on the land, then there would be bloodshed. Anyways, if you go to Alcatraz now, it still has, we can see here in the bottom picture, it still says Indians welcome, it still has the spray paint on there from the occupation. They have not removed that. So another takeover will be the takeover of Winter Dam in Wisconsin. So they built this dam in 1921. Of course, when you build a dam, that floods all the, the area behind the dam. That area that got flooded was controlled, was owned by the local tribe there. That was their land. But the government says of Wisconsin, says, you know, we need this hydroelectric power. We need this reservoir. So we're going to dam this land and flood uh, all of your acres of land, right? They're going to lose thousands of acres. It's going to destroy their crops. And it's going to flood their graveyards. 50 years later, the American Indian Movement will help organize there to take over the dam. They will assist the local tribe. Winter Dam had a 50-year license renewal about to expire, and they will try to block the renewal. And, and through their blocking of it, through their occupation of it, they will force the governor to negotiate. The governor eventually gives them 25,000 acres of land to try to repay the land that they flooded, and it will give them rights to the hydroelectric power that's generated at the dam. So they do get some positives out of this. So how many acres were replaced after the winter dam takeover? 1,000, 10,000, 25,000, or 50,000? Some pictures, okay, some demonstrators at uh, the winter dam. All right, the Trail of Broken Treaties March. Okay, it was a large-scale march all the way to Washington, D.C., to the Bureau of Indian Affairs building, which they will eventually occupy, armed, <laughs> to protest all 370 different broken treaties, right? Obviously, this will be met a lot of uh, fear because people are armed and kicking uh, people out of a building. Eventually, though, peace of, peacefully, they will leave the building. The last big one I think we'll talk about here will be the takeover of Wounded Knee. Of the Wounded Knee um, Park. So, 1973, Lakota contacted AIM to help with the cor uh, corruption within the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Tribal Council that was put above the Lakota. Armed Indians decided to, reclue, to reclaim Wounded Knee, right, which was the scene of a famous battle between Indians and American forces. Over 75 nations were represented, so 75 different tribes sent people there to take over Wounded Knee. What they demanded was the investigation into 371 broken trees between the United States and different tribes, the misuse or stealing of tribal funds, and corruption at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Oh, first question on this. So uh, uh, over 75 nations were represented in the takeover of Wounded Knee. They demanded investigations into what? A, broken treaties. B, the misuse of tribal funds. C, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Or D, all of the above. All right, so how will the government uh, address this? So at this point, Wounded Knee is like a tourist location, right? It's not like a, a real, it's not a military or political installation or anything like that. It's a tourist place. So the government's going to cut off electricity immediately, and they're going to try to cut off the, de the uh, delivery of food as well. There'll be gunfire every day. Two people will get killed and 12 will disappear. After 71 days, the siege will officially end, and 1,200 protesters will be arrested. It's a picture of one uh, guy that got shot being carried uh, by one of his fellow tribe members. Okay. How many protesters will eventually get arrested after Wounded Knee? None, 100, 600, or 1,200. All right, AIM today. AIM is still active. There are still many chapters throughout the country uh, committed to confronting the government and corporate forces that seek to marginalize indigenous peoples. One of the big things they fight against now are protesting Indian mascots uh, for schools, uh, for colleges, for professional sports teams, caricatures of Indians that promote um, an unrealistic um, image of them. They're committed to keeping na uh, Native culture alive, uh, but in 93 they split into some different factions over differences in opinions. So some big achievements here. Not pictured in here in the 1930s, part of the New Deal, 
was the Indian Reorganization Act, which provided more power to Native groups to control uh, their own reservations and their own legal systems and stuff like that was a truly positive thing that the government did towards Native Americans, which is frighteningly rare in our history. But in 1968, the Indian Civil Rights Act was passed, which resulted in more self-rule for Native groups, gaining control of their own education systems. In the 70s, they successfully sued for land treaty rights. So the Black Hills that we talked about, that the Sioux got kicked out of because we found gold, they got $106 million in reparations for kicking them off their land. We also carved Mount Rushmore into their land, by the way. Um, so you'll see if you ever go to Mount Rushmore, there's a very large uh, Indian history museum there as well. 1980s and on, they will win gambling, hunting, and fishing rights for some tribes to make money, right? Uh, traditionally, a lot of these tribes made their money or made their living hunting and fishing in certain areas. Uh, a lot of tribes will put up casinos to try to make money for the people in those tribes. There are some that have done it very well and very equitably, and there are some that have done it less so. Uh, but that's um, a big deal in terms of being able to make money on the reservation. So lots of work left. One in four American Indians live in poverty, which is higher than the national average. Their unemployment rate is triple the national average. Their graduation rate is 13% below the national average. So there's still a lot of out, outreach and work to be done. Quite recently, a group was just dissolved. Um, the federal government, in a shockingly tone-deaf decision, especially with this pandemic going on, is trying to dissolve uh, a native group, um, the Wampanoag, I want to say. A uh, group, I'd have to look it up right now. Um, it seems like the whole dispute is over casino rights and some gross political stuff. But a lot of work left to be done, I will say. There's a lot of great books and movies about uh, American Indians and, and our treatment towards them uh, that maybe I can find some attachments to put on here as well. But next and final civil rights movement lecture I will bring to you will be the women's liberation movement. So until then.